Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming out on this snowy spring day <laughs> during Women's History Month. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My friend Barbara Carter was here. She had to leave because her husband's uh, sick right now. But uh, it was fitting because in 1960, she introduced me to drinking tea. And now, 64 years later, I realize that everything I know I learned from the Salada tea tags. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am. The Niagara Falls National Heritage Area has titled my Polly King Portrait Lady Project an anthropological study. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, Anthropology is the scientific study of the origin of the physical, social, and cultural development and behavior of man. I'm sure they met women, too. We will come back to this definition later in my talk. I took anthropology, the physical course, while a student at Niagara County Community College. All I remember is that a lemur can swivel its head on its neck 360 degrees. <laughs> I think I also took cultural anthropology back then, but I cannot say that for sure. A simple slide explanation of Rene Descartes' theory is, if you take something apart and look at its pieces individually, and then put the pieces all back together again, you will end up with more than you had when you started. The years I worked in infection control, I learned that you can never know what you might have prevented by taking a correct action. I take that, I say that because, whoops, I <laughs> know. No, I should have. A correct action would have been to have had that lid on properly. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I said that because uh, during the pandemic, I felt helpless. Uh, I was too old to go back to work as a nurse, and I had actually worked as infection control uh, at the hospital for seven years. And so I made each of the living portrait ladies the mask with their portrait on it. <laughs> this is mine, so uh, it actually was a nice way to connect with, to connect with the ladies and to uh, let them know I was thinking about them and to feel that I was doing something positive in terms of the pandemic. Thank you for the water, Don. During the time I have worked on this project, if I had to choose between not writing up a portrait lady's chapter or writing one of them a letter, then I chose to do the latter. This was not conducive to finally getting the project finished in a timely manner. I've only finished volume one so far out of five. But it's difficult to write a biographical sketch on someone if you don't know anything about the person. So that's why I chose to write the letters to the portrait ladies rather than working on writing up the chapters. When I took child psychology at community college, um, we had to write a paper on Piaget, the child psychologist. And one of the people in my class Sat in, her, sat in her cellar, her basement, and made up her whole project. She made it all up. Uh, we had to interview five children and have them do different experiments uh, of Piaget and see what results we got from it. And she sat in the basement and she made hers all up. I don't know what mark she got on the project, but I do know that I didn't want it to be like that when I was working on my Polly King project. I wanted as much as I possibly could to have what I was writing be the truth. 
looking around the room, you might be wondering what is going on with my quilts, my masks, uh, the frames. Uh, although I consider it a privilege to have been a nurse for 44 years, I did not want to live and die without making something pretty. Mm. I really don't know what motivate, motiv motivated the artist Polly King, but I do have some ideas about that. Polly once said that today's artist is the last champion of the free mind. Um, I think that Polly was someone that knew who she was inside, and I especially liked that about her. This being Women's History Month, it's fitting to discuss a subject that is near and dear to my heart, Polly King and her portrait ladies. I've given you a handout, and I'd like to re review it with you if you don't mind. Uh, Hang on here till I find it. Big one? See. Yeah. Yahoo, yeah, where are you? Thanks, Sarah. It's got the picture volume one on the front. Every title page as you open it up, and a picture of Polly's portrait, a self portrait that she did in 1961 with a broken arm. So she's painting with her left hand. I could never have imagined what was going to happen after I moved to the Progressive Arts Building at 1517 Main Street. At that time, the first floor of the newly remodeled structure housed an art framing business and an empty art gallery. Tom Brown, the property owner, lived on the third floor. In May of 1991, I became the tenant on the second floor. Main Street, Niagara Falls, New York, was having its last hurrah. Jen's department store, Slipco's Groceries, Rite Aid Pharmacy, Shantae's Millinery, Kellogg's Stationery, The Book Corner, Modern Electrical Appliance Company, and the Marine Bidlam Bank were all still open, as were other businesses along the Main Street Corridor. There was a thriving Wilson Farms convenience store on the corner adjacent to where I lived and the Niagara Falls Earl Bridges Public Library was almost next door. All right, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and say that as it happened two weeks after I moved into the building, I learned my landlord had listed the building for sale. He explained with so many of the Niagara Falls factories closing and or relocating, there was not the corporate need for artwork framing that he had made, that had mainly sustained his business in past years. In spite of being disappointed, I understood. I had lived on Main Street for only a few months when one evening in September of 1991, my landlord surprised me by inviting me downstairs to his art gallery. Beautiful paintings were hung on all the previously bare walls. There were well over 100 people in attendance for an art exhibit to commemorate the 90th birthday of the local artist, Polly King. I had first seen Polly King's name written on a portrait in 1958, 33 years earlier, when at the age of 15, I was employed as a mother's helper for Mrs. Patricia Gillick in Lewiston Heights. Polly had painted Mrs. Gillick's portrait in 1956, and it highlighted the living room wall of the Gillick home. The ensuing 33 years had passed quickly, and before that evening at the Progressive Arts Gallery, I did not even know if Polly King was alive. So moving right along, I talked a little there about myself and what I'd been doing all those 33 years. And then uh, when I looked at, uh, I looked around at Polly's various works of art on display at the exhibit, and 
I purchased a small watercolor and she actually called me the next day or so and said that she'd lost my check. So I went over to give her a, a different, ch a new check and we became friends. So Polly and I spent a lot of time together. I was working as a, a public health nurse for the Niagara County community, for the Niagara County Health Department. And I would go over to Polly's after work. And one day, my, well, my daughter was sick in, in California and expecting and so I decided to resign my job and I went out there to for seven weeks to spend time with my daughter while she had the new baby. But before I went, Polly called and said, come over here and bring a hat, I'm going to paint your portrait. So that was when she painted my portrait and she packed a lunch for me to eat on the plane. I remember there being an egg salad sandwich cut into four triangles and a small plastic bag full of sweet grapefruit wedges along with a miniature silver spoon. Oh, so like Polly. I returned to Niagara Falls seven weeks after I had left. Then when I got back, uh, Polly, I would go to visit Polly and she showed me her sketchbooks and um, Polly died on March 16th, 1993. And after her funeral, her son Don and daughter-in-law Betty DiCamillo King invited me to visit Polly's house as often as I wanted. I was even given a key to her house. I went there frequently to browse through her plentiful ske sketchbooks, journals, canvases, and scrapbooks. Sometimes I went to Polly's house just to soak up the artistic atmosphere. Everything laying around, including the little stones and the rocks that she painted scenes on, were remnants of a creative life well lived. Time passed as I continued to explore Polly's house and its contents. I found portraits, portraits, and portraits. I, I mean, I won't go into all the different places that I found them, but <laughs> I have never really counted them. I estimated there had to be over 200 ladies' portraits at Polly's house. Being a curious person, I wondered who all these ladies were. I decided then and there that I would try to photograph and identify each portrait, find and interview each subject or family member, do research on each individual, write a biographical sketch, including the portrait lady's memories of the artist, and compile all the information into a book. I further decided to include all the ladies who had their portraits in their own homes, mm -hmm. as I suspected there were many of them. My work on this book officially began May 1st, 1996. I embarked upon photographing the portraits with my small Tele Electric 600 Kodak camera, making several trips to Polly's house to complete this task. I then drove to the local Kmart store with rolls of 126 Kodak film to have the pictures developed. I picked the printed images up a week or two later, no one hour service back then. So it's different, things have changed. Um, early in my research at the local history room of the Niagara Falls Earl Bridges Public Library, I found much written on the endeavors and accomplishments of the men of Niagara Falls. Yet I determined to find and share what the Polly King portrait ladies were achieving. These ladies, too, were intricately woven into the history of the city of Niagara Falls and the, its surrounding area. In painting the portraits of so many women from the 1920s to the early 1990s, Polly King gifted our community with a historical record of an era now gone. So that was kind of the introduction to, to Polly's chapter. Each lady has their own chapter, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about some of the ladies. One of the portrait ladies just came in, and by the way, just so you I know. I saw that. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Sandy. <laughs> I'm very thankful that you could make it. Thank 
I would like to just say too that uh, I'll, I, when I was mentioning that about the lemur and the anthropology course that I took, that uh, I'm not an anthropologist, even though it says that on that poster over there that I did an anthropological study. But I do want you to know that I love James Michener, his books. Uh, this, he's an American author. He passed away, but he wrote books such as The Source, The Covenant, Hawaii's, Chesapeake, Centennial. Um, I, I just love reading his books. And the reason that I love him is because he starts at the beginning of a place, even before there's any people there. He starts with the plants and the animals that live someplace. And then gradually he adds the different generations. And so that at the end of the story, or further on in the story, mm -hmm. the people alive then don't know who was there before them, but we know because we read the books. So it's just really, uh, it's an experience when you read James Michener's books. And I think that uh, it's sort of like what I felt when I was working on Poly, on Polly's, Polly's portrait ladies, looking at them and, and tracing the history of the city. So um, I, I wanted to mention that, but now I'm looking here for, my, for some of my comments on the, on the portrait ladies themselves. Um, I found that the women had made very significant contributions to our city and to the surrounding area. <clears throat> Alicia, Alicia Granto was awarded the Academic Advisor of the Year at Buffalo State College in 1989. And she's the person who was a Cuban exile when, when Fidel Castro took over. Uh, Gloria Inuzzi Greenman worked on the Manhattan Project, and I saw just on the news last night that $67 million has been allotted to help clean up the Niagara Falls storage area of nuclear waste that's between Lewiston and Lockport, and that $750 million more will be needed to clean up the two local sites. So Gloria worked on the Manhattan Project. Jacqueline Koshin Belargen was a New York State Supreme Court judge, a trailblazing judge, it said in her obituary. And here we have Betty Deke Millo King, who, worked, who at 90 years old is still working at, at her family bakery, the Deke Millo Bakery. So I'll uh, say no more about uh, what some of the portrait ladies have done. Jenny Phillips White studied at the New England Conservatory of Music, and uh, she was the concert master, the head violinist at the Niagara Falls, Falls Philharmonic Orchestra. And many people don't even realize that Niagara Falls used to have a Philharmonic Orchestra. Carol Chido Fleshman is an author, and she wrote a book, Nadine, My Funny and Trusty Gu Guide Dog. And she's also written several My View columns. Excuse me a sec here. I'm reading you a little bit from, from Carol Chido's um, chapter. This is Which Alicia Grando. Has their own chapter. Chapter. Alicia, hi. I heard the scream just seconds before I turned my head and felt the rock smash into my eye, causing a sharp pain. The left lens of my glasses has shattered into my eye. I saw my glasses fall like a feather drifting down towards the ground in slow motion. With my left palm held over my newly damaged eye, I tried to catch my broken glasses with my right hand, but I failed. 
Panic stricken, I thought I need my glasses. I can't see without them. Earlier, my cousin and I had walked from her house in Madisonville, PA, down the road to the Henry Drinker Elementary School to watch a Little League baseball game. We had crawled onto the bleachers and were cheering and enjoying the game with other grade school students. Unknown to me, there was a boy my age, about 10 or 11 at the time, who had a crush on me. He was sitting on the bleachers across from us with another group of spectators. Trying to get my attention, he picked up a rock and threw it towards me. That must have been when someone screamed. I don't remember much of what happened next, except that I was sitting in the ophthalmologist's chair and the doctor was using tiny tweezers to remove the splinters of glass from my eye. I later learned that Aunt Dorothy Ald, Mama's older sister, had been notified and she had driven me to the doctor's office. Even back then, it was a well-known fact that Aunt Dorothy always drove like a bat out of hell. <laughs> a fact I am thankful for to this day. Additionally, I have never been one who liked wearing glasses, especially as a child. But upon reflection, I later realized it was probably my glasses that prevented the rock from hitting directly into my eye, causing irreparable harm to it. My eye healed in time, and it did not seem to suffer any permanent damage. It is often only in retrospect that we see God's hand at work, but vision is such a precious gift. Carol Fleshman lost her vision at an early age due to a genetic condition called retinitis pigmentosa. It causes a slow but progressive vision loss. Throughout her life, Carol has shown great courage and perseverance. A talented author, speaker, and role model, she has not let her vision loss define who she is. Getting to know Carol has been one of the greatest honors I have experienced in writing this Polly Kate book. That was author commentary. So that was Carol, Carol Fleshman. Then there's Beverly Fader, who in 2017 was honored for 50 years of bringing ballet to the Niagara Falls area. Uh, Deborah Sawicki Cutler is an accountant, accountant and a gardener, and she's sitting right there with that pretty blue scarf on. And Glenn Close, Polly sketched some movie stars from, from TV when she saw them, and I chose to include them in my book. Glenn Close was an, an actress and a mental health advocate. And then there's Olive May Davis Slepian, and I'm going to read you a little about her from her chapter, an author commentary. Only slightly subdued by the presence of the sun, the warm glow cast by the outside light on the front of the house at 959 Lafayette Avenue beckoned me to turn the car into the driveway. Exiting from the driver's side, I shivered. It was a cold winter's day. As I knocked on the door, it was opened by a smiling, youthful-looking, white-haired woman. I entered the home, the living room lay to the left. A crackling fire burned in the fireplace. Quietly, a piece of wood shifted position and hundreds of tiny sparks burst open like a mini fireworks display. Needless to say, I felt welcomed. In the far corner of the room, oh, I should mention, right here, this, that's Mrs. Slepian, right there. That is her portrait. In the far corner of the room, with its bench pulled out and sheet music opened, a grand piano stood silently moored like a log, large ship in a harbor waiting for its captain. Oh, captain, my captain, I thought, the memory of a boy standing on a desk and saying those words in the movie Dead Poet Society starring Robert Williams filled my mind. Sitting down on the sofa and gazing back towards the entrance, 
There is a small alcove. There in a small alcove I saw the portrait. It sat unframed on a high, narrow, ornately carved chair, the back and seat of which were upholstered in red velvet. I just brought the two of them down for the, from the attic, said Olive. Struck by the regalness of the image in the portrait, I immediately understood this was no ordinary woman. Her serene face, surrounded by soft brown hair and cloistered by a head covering of royal blue, emerged from a background of orange and yellow flames. I wondered, had she walked through the flames? Was this some ancient memory of the destruction of the temple? and a testimony to one of the survivors. Even her name, Olive, spoke of a faraway time and place. The woman in the image wore a huge segmented gold necklace, a touch of the artist's creativity, I was to learn. It was similar to the one worn in official portraits of the late Russian monarch, Catherine the Great. By coincidence, or was it, both women gave up the religion of their youth Lutherism to accept the faith of their husbands. Yes, I became a pro proselyte, a convert to another religion, Olive remarked proudly. When I first changed to the Jewish religion after Alex and I were married, I was very dogmatic about it. I learned how to read and write Hebrew. I learned Kaddish. The prayer said every Friday night when someone dies, I wanted to be able to say this for my husband when he passed away. So that was Olive Slepian, and as I said, her portrait's over there. Um, I could go on and on and, uh, with the accomplishments of the portrait ladies. I've, I learned a lot about about them and their lives, and I, I made a lot of good friends along the way. Um, I'd like to, at this time, take a few moments to read some of my acknowledgments, even though it's probably, uh, I'm not quite at the end of my talk, but I'd like to make sure that I do this before people have to leave. In addition to those mentioned at the beginning of and throughout each Polly King Portrait Ladies chapter, I would especially like to thank Don J. King, Betty A. D. Camillo King, and the entire King family. The Polly King Art Group, words cannot express my gratitude. You never gave up on me. William J. Rukowski, my husband, you assisted me in more ways than I can ever repay. You took countless beautiful photographs for the Polly King Project. You accompanied me and often drove me for interviews and research trips. You shopped for office supplies. You offered comfort and encouragement when I needed it the most. John T. Loss, my son, at the very beginning of this project, you remarked that my idea of trying to find the Polly King portrait ladies Writing a biographical sketch on each one and putting it all in a book reminded you of The Bridge of San Luis Rey by Thornton Wilder, American author, 1897 to 1975. You said all the ladies were gathered here so Polly could paint them. Your statement inspired me and made me question if there was more to this project than I had initially thought. That inspiration led me directly to the discovery that the portrait ladies' lives were woven into the history of Niagara Falls. This insight has helped sustain me through the many years of work on this project. Nancy W. Loss, my daughter, for all kindnesses and for your good beef stew. There's Nancy. Rebecca A. Corsaro, my daughter, and Michelle M. Muller, my granddaughter, for providing technical assistance by teaching me the intricacies of the computer and the cell phone. Your patient has been priceless. Christopher M. Loss, my son, for spelling corrections and encouragement. Sister Mary Balthasar, Niagara University Nursing Department, my nursing research professor. Every time I ask you a question, you ask me several questions in return. You taught me to anticipate the questions and to attempt to answer them myself. 
Father Lewis Trotter and Professor Tom McDermott, Niagara University Education Department, my unsung, my unsung heroes, thank you, could never be enough. Michael Bean, Niagara University, Marion Granfield, Niagara University, Nancy Nachtel, Niagara University, Niagara County Community College, and Dr. Madeline Kaufman, Canisius College, my art history professors. You opened up a whole new world when you taught me about the artists of the past. Margaret Brooks Grimm, my editor, you stayed with me through all the many years of correcting the errors on my typewritten pages with your red pen. Your knowledge of the English language is absolutely remarkable. Michelle A. Kratz, Lewiston Public Library, my favorite genealogist. You assisted me whenever I asked for help and many times before I even asked. Pete Ames, Town of Niagara historian, your friendly smile and professional work ethic always accompanied your contributions to this project. The staff at the Niagara Falls Earl Bridges Public Library, particularly the local history room, my mentors, my friends, Linda, Cecilia. Now, Cecilia, when I told you that I didn't have the internet or email on my home computer, here is what she said. Oh, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Cecilia. Helga, Mary, Maureen, Courtney, Maxine, Louise, Townley, Richard, Elise, who's now working at the uh, some great library in, in Washington, D.C. I forgot the name of it. It's that big one that's there. And Wendy, you are the best. Your directors, Betty, Michelle, and Sarah are to be commended. All the local newspapers, and I've got them all listed here. You have been my main source of information for the past 28 years. You are my hope for the future. The Niagara Falls National Heritage Area, Sarah, Allie, Deidre, Hope, Becca, and Sophie. You gave credibility to the Polly King Project that assisted in making the Polly King Portrait Ladies visible to the public. Through both your extraordinary exhibit on the outside windows of the vacant Gents store building, Main Street, and inside at 2351 Whirlpool Street, Niagara Falls, New York. Last but not least, my family and friends who contributed to this project in many different and valuable ways. May God bless you all. So I, I, as I said, I wanted to read that to you before our time ran out. I'm not going to let it run out. <laughs> Pardon? And this exhibit is too important. I'm not going to let it run out. When this oh, in, going in closing. Is closing. I'll take a deep breath because I'm about to close. Okay. In closing, many art historians have said that art does not evolve. I believe that it does in an awakened awareness, a consciousness in the artists that there is something more in what they are doing, something beyond themselves. I think Polly King had this awareness that there was something beyond herself in her work. Polly King might not have discovered exactly what it was, but she knew that she had it, that she was making a record of Niagara Falls through her brush strokes, through her portraits. And I think that it gave her great satisfaction. It is a known fact that if you go deep into science, you will hit art. Just look at a rainbow or a crystal or a, a, a snowflake. We saw plenty of them this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but it, I, I feel anthropology is defined as a scientific study. And so if you think about it, uh, I believe that if you go deep enough into art that you will hit science. 
And I think Polly King did just that. Do you have any questions or do you have any memories of Polly or all the things that you would like to say? Alicia, you missed the part about that we said you were, you got the award for being the counselor of the year. <laughs> I'm humbled. Are you saying that? You said um, about Polly, uh, she was just phenomenal and uh, sort of transformational in my life. Uh, I remember hanging out with her. Uh, we would go out to lunch at uh, the uh, Ramada Inn and uh, uh, we may have been accompanied by a mutual friend, uh, Dominic Januzzi, if you remember, from Niagara University. And we'll be sitting down having a wonderful conversation. And invariably, at least three to five people will come by the table and just sort of uh, bow in front of her. And uh, she will be very gracious. And the minute they will walk away, she will go back to whatever point she had left the conversation at. <laughs> That was very impressive to me because I have been with other so-called very prominent people and as they were recognized, they would, you know, just say, oh, you know, that's so and so on, you know. And she was just so natural mm -hmm. about the fact that, okay, I, I am known here, but I was having this conversation before. Let me just, you know, go back to it and, and finish it. That was very impressive to me, you know, being young and... Uh, and some of the people that were here around us would say, oh my God, how could you have so much in common with this old woman? I said, this old woman, as she put it, is very wise. Mm -hmm. And just from being with her, I'm learning a great deal. So that's something that I do miss tremendously. I really do. Thank you. Thank that you. was very beautiful. Great. Anybody else? Bill, did you want to mention anything about when we went to Italy? Come on up here. You you can come on up here, Bill, and tell the story about when we went to Italy. Not all of it, Bill. Just tell some of it. All the sites. Not the whole trip. Three more hours. <laughs> no, we went to Italy, and uh, we, we found that uh, this one uh, lady played the violin, and uh, she had died, but but. Uh, her daughter was there instead of going on one of the our regular trip thing. We went to her house and visited with her. We took some pictures there, but and it was so nice meeting the daughter. And when we got home, the pictures didn't really turn out that good. And my uh, Sandra wrote a letter to her asking if she could take a picture of the ones that we had taken before, but we didn't hear from her in a while, but then we found out that she had died. And the person that were, was in charge of, of her will and stuff, they found, these, found Sandra's letter and they actually sent her the original picture of her, of the, and so we were really shocked that she, they thought enough of us that, that she sent that picture. I guess there was no one else in the family that wanted that, but <laughs> we sure did. <laughs> and what, what a shock and a wonderful surprise. So it was a really fun trip. And we, like I say, we, we never thought we'd get to Italy and all that alone meet meets the daughter of the, one of the portrait ladies. And it was wonderful the whole trip. So I'm very thankful. I, I'm thankful for a lot, a lot of the people we met, the portrait ladies and family and everything, and people that are helping us right now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I started this project in 1996, and Bill and I got married in 1998. And uh, Bill didn't realize it at the time, but he married Polly, too. <laughs> <laughs> so it was Jenny White, the violinist. Uh, and the picture that they sent was 
when she was age 16 and she's holding her violin. It's a really beautiful picture, a real picture. So anybody else have any memories of Polly or anything else you'd like to add or comments or questions? You might not know the answers. <laughs> Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about Polly Put the Kettle On? Polly Put the Kettle On. Well, when you met Polly King, she became your friend. And when you'd go over to her house, whether it was to have your portrait painted or for whatever it was you went over for, she invited you to stay for tea. So that was the name of the book. That's the name of the book that I'm writing, Polly Put the Kettle On. Um, because Polly really, uh, in addition to being a wonderfully great artist, she was a wonderfully great person. So that was the Polly put the kettle on. Yes, Deidre. I was wondering if you could tell the story of returning the portrait back to Seattle. Oh, well, the... Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there were over 200 portraits at least at Polly's house on Chilton Avenue, and one of them was Mary Levy's. Now, Mary Levy and Ralph Levy were uh, part of the owners of the Levy store that was on Pine Avenue that sold, sold furniture and appliances. And uh, Mary's portrait was still at the house, and uh, I, I tried to call her, her daughter, this one person, Marsha Khan, who lived on the same street as Polly for many years. Marsha Khan gave me all these addresses and helped with identifying portraits. And she gave me the address and phone number of Mary Levy's daughter who lived in Seattle, Washington. Well, I knew I'd never get to Washington. Uh, so I called, I called Reva Rose Levy, that was the daughter, Reva Rose Levy Vivek, and I asked her, uh, you know, I told her that her mother's portrait was still at the house, at Polly's house, and she said that there was another mother, of, another portrait of her mother there too, and that there was also one of her that Polly had painted. So I asked her to please send me pictures of them because I figured we would never get to Seattle. Well, time passed, years actually, and uh, Bill's son Kenny and his wife moved to Seattle and they had a new baby girl. So we went out there for a week to, to stay with the, to see with, you know, to see the new baby and everything. And Kenny, Bill's son, drove us over to Reva Rose house, and I had taken, uh, because Don King gave it to me, I put it in my suitcase, the portrait of Mary Levy, and took it to Reva Rose. And then while we were there, Bill was able to take pictures of the other portrait and Reva Rose Levy's. And then an interesting uh, P.S. about that is, I was not able to get any real photos of them. Some people are very shy about uh, giving you a photo or whatever. But it, as it turned out, just within the last month or so, uh, I was able to make contact with Reva's daughter, who was Mary Levy's granddaughter, and Reva sent me 31 pictures of Reva and Mary on my cell phone. So, of course, I had to quickly revise those chapters and put in those new pictures. But then one of the, uh, art, one of the pictures actually was a newspaper article. And after I, uh, actually, Bill went to the library for me and they pulled up the article for microfilm. And there, it said in there about that Mary had made her own head cap or her own headpiece for her wedding. And uh, I, I text Cheryl, the, uh, the granddaughter of Mary, and ask if she might have a wedding picture, and she sent it to me. And it's out there in that book, and it's just perfectly beautiful. 
in Mary Levy's section. It's from, I believe, 1923, and it's a sepia color, and it's just beautiful. So that was like a real pleasant thing that happened after the fact, you know. So actually, my editor had said to me, you know, you're going to have to have a cutout line, a cutout of when you're not going to put anything more in. <laughs> in terms of information, you know? And so I I just had to put those pictures in and stuff. So that was that, the, the Seattle story. That was real, really happy. Some of the things that happened like that were just so coincidental, you know? Like I, I was working at the uh, Stella Niagara Health Center on the taking care of the elderly nuns. And after I had left my job in infection control, and I went up on the third floor, and they always put up on their little bulletin board, their little chalkboard, they put up if it's a special day. And up there they had, I was working midnights, and up there they had St. Colette's Day, well, it just so happened that that day I had an appointment to go see Colette Sorcy, who was a Polygon portrait lady. So that was, that was the kind of coincidence that happened while I was working on the project. And they still continue to happen now. So I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful for your, your attention. Glad that you could make it. Have a great day. Thank you.